named. I don't have them all at my command. Well, how can you propose to solve the problems of the company that you're now running if you don't know the names of the people who caused that problem? Because there are great people running AIG. White collar crime seems to have become part of our status quo. As new scandals sprout to the surface almost daily, the constant confusion creates a citizenry desensitized to corporate crime, and most people can't even fathom the frauds, let alone resolve the cognitive dissonance created by the frauds. I, 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 I'm just not going to do that, sir, because that will provide, that'll be the, that could be a list of people that we could do some. Individuals who wanted to do damage to them could do that. Well, listen, Just not these dead. same people could now be working right now, today, at Citibank. Is it more important to protect them, the ones who caused the $100 billion loss, or protect us? Which is more important to you right now? The important thing is to protect both. I'm just not going to sit here and give it to you until I understand what the implications are. Can I count on you to give us that list? Uh, yes or no? I, I will. I, I do not know. I will consult with our general counsel and decide what the appropriate course of action is. Not the answer I was hoping for, but my time is up. The criminals have become accustomed to refusing congressional inquiries and expert at bending and bribing our representatives to their will, now with the approval of the Supreme Court. But that's only because we, the people, have been kept in the dark as to how this all perpetuates. Tonight, we shed some light by presenting a story censored by the establishment media and relevant to anyone who uses money, plans for the future, and is aware enough to listen and consider the views expressed by our guest, a Wall Street whistleblower whose experiences illustrate how the legislation implemented by Congress, which should have been a protective measure against fraud, actually favored rogue financial services companies and was used as a weapon of fraud against the people. And today, many trillions of dollars are still unaccounted for. We begin with the Sarbanes-Oxley Act of 2002, the law created as a strategic solution to reduce white-collar crime and to address a number of major corporate and accounting scandals, including those infecting Enron, Tyco International, WorldCom, and many others. This is an interview which demonstrates the gross negligence of the regulatory agencies, courts, and media outlets, whose actions indicate that it's more important to protect the frauds and ensure the rights of rogue corporations than to serve your interests and preserve the public trust. This is also the story of a corporate account executive who blew the whistle under the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, who warned the SEC in 2003, and who was subsequently retaliated against, terminated, and blacklisted, whereupon he brought a multi-billion dollar corporation into court, leveraging the alleged protections granted to whistleblowers under the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. Among his clients were AIG, J.P. Morgan, Goldman Sachs, Merrill Lynch, Lehman Brothers, Bear Stearns, Tyco International, WorldCom, Northrop Grumman, and DynCorp, among other government contractors and notorious global financial institutions. And what he discovered was a backdoor in the Sarbanes-Oxley compliance software which he was tasked to sell these companies. And that the law was being employed by executives to further obscure frauds from public scrutiny. After reading more than a thousand pages of court transcripts related to this case, Vancouver-based documentary filmmaker Paul Verge flew to Connecticut to interview this whistleblower and shed some much-needed light on these events. The result is what follows, an enlightening and empowering perspective which dampens confusion and stimulates understanding. This interview was conducted on December 10th, 2009 and is entitled 2020 Hindsight, Censorship on the Front Line. Well, how, in your experience, are massive frauds like the Bernie Madoff scandal, for instance, successfully perpetrated outside of our awareness? The fraud is perpetrated, and you know this from the news, and you see the evidence in the news. So what you have is people who have known about this fraud, the whistleblowers, have done their job. They've gone to court, they've collected their evidence, they've gone to the media, and where the ball's being dropped is the, the fourth estate is not publishing this information. So. In the case of the Madoff scandal, there was a guy named Harry Markopoulos who came forward to the SEC 
and said Madoff's running a scam. And the SEC chose not to enforce on that scam, thus allowing the scam to be perpetrated and everyone getting taken advantage of. So it's a failure of the fourth estate to carry forward the information and evidence from whistleblowers and get that information to the public, the investors, the people who own those companies, etc., who are probably unwitting and in the dark to most of it. What do whistleblowers like yourself actually encounter when they finally decide to blow the whistle? The way it works is that if you're a whistleblower, you're reaching out to what you feel are credible entities that were going to take this information, research it, validate it, and present it to the public in a coherent manner such that people can understand that which you're blowing the whistle and risking your career on. And what you find is that many news agencies simply aren't interested. They say our readers aren't interested when in fact it just means it's a conflict of interest with their advertising. Other agencies will take your information and look at it only to tell us later that, well, we can't print this even though it's interesting. It's just not something something that we can go ahead with. Again, it's, it's, it's a conflict of interest between the people who are actually funding those media entities and the whistleblowers who are coming forward with this information and trying to get it out to people and not understanding that many of these news agencies were built specifically by other corporations in order to manage news effectively, to edit news, to, to suppress news, to censor news, to make sure that whistleblower testimony does not get out to the public. And when that fourth estate that is supposed to be there watching the government and reporting back to the people and empowering us such that we can get ourselves around this information and have the context to make informed choices in our lives, that breakdown is essential to be known to the public because once you understand the fourth estate is broken down, you'll start to look at some of this stuff for yourself and you'll start to see that what they're telling you on the news is not only contradictory and misleading, but it's outright aiding and abetting the frauds that are in progress because a lot of these news agencies will suppress and sit on whistleblower information that if circulated would stop those frauds in progress and send out a warning to everybody to become aware that there are people out there doing X, Y, and Z and, and this some sort of Ponzi scheme that Madoff had for instance and they would become aware and they would move their money and that would mean the people running the fraud would make a lot less money so when you have not only journalists but probably you know the protection agencies that are in on keeping a lid on these frauds so that the people doing it can perpetrate it fully to its to its full maturity and not get caught in its adolescence and have it blow up in their faces by the time you find out about Madoff he's already stolen billions from tens of thousands of people potentially and it's already gone and no one knows where the money's at and it's just another example of how the fourth estate could have done their job but they chose not to and how the enforcement agencies are more likely to protect the corporations doing these types of frauds than they are the public interest and I just thought people should know after you know after figuring all of this out this is the only way to get it out if your evidence and whistleblower testimony were published by Frontline in 2004 would the Madoff scandal have been possible no, because for it to have been possible, the American people would have had to forget facts that they have already had presented in front of them, which made them understand that this giant fraud was taking place on mammoth, like enormous Leviathan-like levels that were taking over all these corporations through broad spectrum regulations put out there to protect the markets, when really it was empowering corporations to circumvent the markets and have nobody find out until after the damage is done. So the short answer is no, because the public would have to forget what they knew in order for it to happen. What about the AIG fraud, the nationalization of numerous companies and all of the bailouts? Had the public become aware that the SEC was no longer protecting the integrity of the markets as its mandate appears to be, when you see that those actions conflict with the mandate and you see that there's no integrity with the markets and that the watchdogs that are actually supposed to protect us and public interest in our investments and our retirement accounts are actually out to lunch on the take and protecting these frauds that are in place to steal billions and trillions of dollars, then you look at the bailouts and the AIGs and the General Motors and all these different 2008, 2009, going into 2010 kind of corporations that are all getting helped along instead of, you know, capitalism says if you can't survive, then you go extinct. And it doesn't tell you that uh, you're supposed to get bailed out by the government. And when you see that these things are contrived and then you see that 